In Galatians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16 and going down through verse number 24, inspiration paints for us a portrait of a contrast between living life in accordance to the lusts of the flesh and living a life being governed by the Spirit. And Paul admonishes the Galatians to walk in the Spirit so that they would not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And again, the flesh and the spirit are diametrically opposed to one another, and certainly their conduct is diametrically different from one another. Then you come to verses 19 and following, and you see the conduct that results from living a life governed strictly by the flesh. Paul notes that the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousies, wraths, factions, divisions, parties, envyings, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I forewarn you, even as I did forewarn you, that they who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Some of the most devastating, destructive, and deadly of sins are those that, are, that arise from our disposition or attitudes and again, which comes from our hearts. And remember, as a man thinketh in his heart, so, are, so is he. And two of such are found here in the works of the flesh. Jealousy and envy. And certainly these two dispositions make for a frightening Goliath that every one of us must confront and deal with in the proper manner because, as the Apostle Paul penned, these dispositions will keep us out of heaven. But yet, as we have seen in previous Goliath lessons, though our Goliaths we face are formidable, they can be overcome. The key, though, is understanding what they are and what they do. And thus, we want to define what jealousy and envy is, what they do to us. We want to look at examples of such. And then, and only then, can we take the preventive measures necessary for combating and defeating the Goliath of jealousy and envy. And, and, and again, we're primarily emphasizing envy here because it, it really stems from a jealous attitude. And, and though they are similar, and though they do differ, and they do differ, they are still similar in some respects and thus can be dealt with similarly. So with this foundation in mind, first of all, let's define what we mean. First of all, jealousy is anxiety due to the success of a rival and resentment of that rival. Now, we have to be careful here because there are two kinds of jealousy that we find in the Bible. There is a godly kind of jealousy. That, that is, there is a proper jealousy. And then there is a worldly or sinful jealousy. Notice with me uh, Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. We find that God is a jealous God. That is, God will not tolerate any rivals. In this context, he warns Israel, and he, he explicitly told them early on, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the, in the earth beneath or that is the, in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Well, why, why is this? Because they are idols. These are false gods. For I, God goes on to say, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. You see, he will not tolerate any rivals. And idols are rivals to him. Why did Israel go away into captivity? Idolatry, as we've talked about in our study of Hosea. But then you go on to chapter 34 and verse 14. God warns Israel there. Thou shalt, not worship, thou shalt worship no other God. For Jehovah, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God does not brook anything that comes between His people's relationship with Him. Further, you come to the New Testament, and you will find in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 2, that the Apostle Paul possessed the same jealousy, and really this is the same jealousy we need to have as Christians today. He possessed a godly jealousy over the Corinthians, for he, he, he writes to them in the second letter saying, 
For I am jealousy over you with a godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that is, through the preaching of the gospel and their reception of the gospel, they became espoused to Christ. And again, remember, the church is Christ's beautiful bride. We are married to Him. As Christians, we wear His name, Christian. And you can't have a Christian without Christ. And so Paul goes on to say that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. That is, the church is to be without spot and blemish. On the other hand, though, there is that wrong kind of jealousy. And it is that which is, and it is that green eyed monster which mocks the meat it feeds on, as Shakespeare once wrote. And this kind of jealousy brings nothing but misery. As, je- as Christians, if jealousy is to be found in our lives, it must be that jealousy which God has. He is jealous for His name. He is jealous for His word. He is jealous for His people. And He is jealous for His worship. And the list goes on. And we need to have that same jealousy. Now on the other hand, we, need, we might ask, what is envy? Well, envy is an attitude which can grow out of jealousy. That is, this is when jealousy becomes sinful. It is, it is sinful when it leads to other sins. And, and envy stems from jealousy. And simply put, it is ill will, spot, or to deprive. Now, there are two words in the New Testament rendered envy and envyings, and I gave you those on the outline. One word which, from which our English word zeal is derived In that context of its usage, it's the envy which casts grudging looks. The word that is translated envyings in Galatians chapter 5 is the envy which arrives at hostile deeds. And so it is that which is going to, which wants to do and will do ill will to others. Now, what is the distinction between the two? Well, simply put, to envy is to want something which belongs to another person. So even this, envying connects in with the sin of covetousness. In contrast, jealousy is the fear that something we possess will be taken away by another. Although jealousy can apply to our jobs, our possessions, our reputations, as we pointed out, the word most often refers to anxiety, which comes when we are afraid that the affection of a loved one might be lost to a rival. We can be jealous of that which belongs to us. We can be envious of what belongs to others. People who are jealous fear losing what is theirs. People who are envious are pained at what belongs to others. You see, they don't want people to, to have that, those things. They think, well, I, I deserve it, so i got to have that. Unlike envy, as we've noted, jealousy can be positive and thus not sinful. Envy, however, is always sinful. Now we might ask ourselves at this juncture, how can I determine if I am envious or not? How can I determine if envy is growing in my heart, in my life? Well, well, consider four questions very briefly. And I'm sure we could think of some others, but these came to my mind as I put this lesson together. Number one, if someone is blessed in a particular way, Do I resent them? If I do, if I have resentment, I may be very well guilty of envy. If I think in my heart, well, they don't really belong, that doesn't really belong to them, they don't need that, I deserve it more than them, that's envy. Number two, if someone receives some kind of honor I believe I deserve, you know, say at work someone gets a promotion or a raise you, you, deserve, you think you deserve, do I despise them? If so, I may be guilty of envy. Number three, if I have friends who do things with, who does things with others without me, does it bother me? Does it really get to me that they're doing things with others when they should be... When I, and I may be thinking, they should spend all their time with me. You see, if I allow it to bother me, I'm guilty of envy. But then, if someone is privy to information I do not have or finds out something before myself, do I, reject, do I react harshly or rashly 
If so, I may well, very well be guilty of envy. So you see from these questions, we can determine, we can ask ourselves simple questions such as those on the screen, and we can come to a determination whether or not we are envious. And if we are not, we can be better prepared, better equipped to not to keep envy out of our lives because it, we are human. And we are prone to human emotions, human, human feelings. And indeed, it, it is the case, even as faithful Christians, we can, if we're not careful, grow envious. This can happen among gospel preachers. Gospel preachers may be envious of other preachers, thinking, well, look where he gets to go. Look what he gets to do. Look where he gets to speak. I don't, and I deserve that more than he does. And I'm stomping on my own toes now. Because I will admit, I've, I've had those feelings a time or two in my past. Guilty as charged. And I've repented. But you see how easy it is for, for you and I as Christians to allow envy to creep into our minds? That's why it's so vitally important that we deal with sins such as envy. That we understand what they are. And as we're going to see, what they can do to us. Now, what are some examples? And certainly, we need to study God's Word about it because when we look at God's Word, the Bible is filled with examples of those who were filled with envy, who were envious. And each example fits the situation in some form or fashion that, our quest, that the questions we've just set forth posed. You know, you start out early on and you look at Genesis 4. What led Cain to murdering his brother Abel? One word, envy. His heart was filled with envy when his brother's sacrifice, which was offered by faith, was accepted by God and his was rejected. Cain probably thought, well, I deserve to have my sacrifice accepted, God. You rejected mine, but you accepted my brother's. This is not fair. And in his envy, he grew angry. He was wroth. He was hot with rage. And as such, he went out and slew his own flesh and blood. Murdered. You see there with the example of Cain, that, that first sin led to other sins. This is what makes envy such a frightening adversary. You look at Genesis 26. Regarding Isaac, we're told that the Philistines were envious of Isaac. And Isaac had possessions of flocks, herds, and many servants. And the Philistines did all they could to try to thwart Isaac. But yet, God continued to bless him. All the while, the Philistines continued to envy Isaac. Then you go to Genesis 30 and you look at the account. The trouble between Jacob and his two wives, Rachel and Leah. Rachel was envious of her sister Leah. When Leah could bear children and she could not, and, and you, you go back into Genesis 29 and you see that, that for a fact. And you look at chapter 30 and verse number 1. Lee, Ra Rachel tells Jacob, give me children. Out of her envy, she demands, give me children or else I die. We might say that Rachel was being a little melodramatic in that case. But why did she make the request or why did she demand it? Because of her envy toward her sister. Joseph's brothers, in Genesis 37 verse 11, they were envious of him. And we understand where their envy led them to do. They sold Joseph into slavery due to envy. And they lied to their father Jacob due to envy about Joseph's whereabouts and what they had done. They deceived him into thinking that Joseph was dead. Well, why did they do that? Why did all of this transpire? That one little word there. They envied him. As we talked about in Sunday morning class a couple of weeks ago, Miriam and Aaron in Numbers 12, remember what happened there? Miriam was stricken with leprosy because they challenged Moses' authority. And I think we alluded to the fact that they were lifted up with envy for, toward Moses and in rebelling against him and speaking evilly of him. And thus they rebelled and paid the consequences. Then later on, as we're, gonna, we're also going to study this event on Sunday morning, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. 
they were envious of Moses and Aaron. And their envy led them to rebel against Moses, which was against the Lord. In Psalm 106, verse 16, we're told they envied Moses also in the camp. And Aaron, the saint of the Lord. And we're going to note the consequence of their sin when we get to it. And then Saul, he envied David. In 1 Samuel 18, it was said that Saul had slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. And we're told in the text there from that moment on, Saul eyed David. Literally, the idea was he envied David. And as such, it led him to do everything he could to put David to death. Well, why did he want David dead? Because he was envious of David. You look at the New Testament, the Jewish religious leaders were specifically told that, that Christ was delivered up to be crucified due to their envy. And Christ himself knew that, as Matthew records in his gospel account there. He knew that for envy they had delivered him. The Jews in Acts 13, 44 and 45 were filled with envy when multitudes gathered to hear the gospel preached. And it envies why the Jews persecuted Christians. I think that's a basic reason why they persecuted. The church at Corinth had a problem with envy. In 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3, in that text, Paul chastised them for their carnal mindedness. One way their carnality or worldly mindedness manifested itself was through their envying one toward another. And, that, and, and envy might very well be the reason why they had divided amongst themselves as we read about in chapter 1. And then you look at Philippians 1. Paul says that some in his day preached Christ out of envy with the motive to cause Paul harm, according to Philippians 1, verses 15 and 16. So we see the Bible has many examples of those who were guilty of envy. Now, how does it characterize envy? What, what does the Bible teach us? about this sin called envy. Well, number one, it teaches us that it is unrighteousness. And remember, according to Romans 1.18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. And we're told specifically in verse number 29 that in that list of unrighteous things, envy is one of them. And envy is an act of unrighteousness because it is a work of the flesh. It comes from fleshly lusts. And it's the result of being driven by the desire to fulfill the lusts of the flesh. But now here's a point we may not think about often. And here's a really startling point to think about. Envy is more dreadful than wrath or anger. In Proverbs 27, in verse number 4, Solomon writes, Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous. Now notice this. But who is able to stand before envy? That's shocking, is it not? Again, he describes, There is no doubt that wrath is cruel, and anger, that sinful kind of anger, remember, it's not, necessary, it's not sinful to become angry. Christ was angry from time to time. We understand that. But we also understand that it is possible to sin in our anger. And that's what Solomon is talking about here. That anger which leads us to sin. It is that which is outrageous. But again, he points out, who is able to stand before envy? But yet I suggest there is a connection between envy and, and this sinful anger and wrath. Further, Envy is spiritual rottenness. It rots our spiritual bones. Solomon in chapter 14 verse 30 writes that a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Notice that. It rots us inside out. It destroys the soul. It rots the soul. It brings spiritual decay. And as a result, it produces unhappiness. An envious person is truly one of the most unhappy people in the world. Why is that? Because it causes individuals to fail to appreciate and enjoy what they have in the here and now. We need to remember that we have been blessed abundantly. Our attitude should be that of the psalmist in Psalm 116 and verse number 12. 
What shall I render unto the Lord? Now notice this. For all His benefits towards me. Think about it. How richly has God blessed us? Very richly. And so what shall I render unto Him for all His benefits? I should render unto Him thankfulness and service and, and obedience. But envy keeps us from that. Envy keeps us in an unhappy state. When we recognize all that God has done for us and continues to do, that will go a long way in solving this problem. But it also causes people to despise others. It causes a person to view others in a hateful, mean, and vicious way, as Joseph's brothers viewed him. And it's little wonder then that it is destructive. It will lead to the loss of the soul if it is unrepented of. Proverbs 3, verse 31, We are exhorted not to choose the way of the wicked. And of course included in the way of the wicked is the way of envying. Now, understanding how the Bible describes envy and what it does to the soul, what it does to the individual, how do we prevent it? How do we prevent envy from arising in our lives? Or if it is there, how, how do we eliminate it? What are some practical steps by which we can keep envy out or drive it out? Well, obviously we have to turn to the pages of God's Word, the all-sufficient source for curing the problem of sin, including envy. And number one, we need to examine our lives. And this includes our attitude. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 talks about the need for self-examination. And so, as we look into our lives, as we examine our lives, as we take, as we take a spiritual inventory, self-inventory of our lives, we must view our hearts, we must view our motives, we must view our lives in light of the perfect law of liberty. We must turn to the mirror of God's Word, as James talks about there in James chapter 1. And you know, when we look into a mirror in the morning, you ever wake up, you look in the mirror, and you don't like what you see? Now, if you saw me first thing in the morning, you'd be terrified. I'm a pretty ugly individual to look at first thing in the morning. Susan would tell you, tell you that as well. But do you realize when we look into the mirror of God's Word, it can reveal to us an image we don't want to see? It reveals to us who we truly are. And so when we look into the mirror, we need to be willing to make the changes that are necessary in order to allow the reflection of our lives as shown in God's mirror, His Word, to be Christ-like in composition. And of course, making those changes involves repentance. It involves purging that attitude out and putting on attitudes, filling our lives with attitudes that are pleasing, that are godly in disposition, as we're going to talk about here in a moment. We need to recognize as well the innate worth and abilities of others along with our own. We don't need to envy others. We don't need to despise others. We are all made in God's image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And we are all the offspring of God. Of one blood hath God made all men. Acts 17, 26. We make up one race. And that is the human race. We all have the same dignity. We all have the same worth. And the eyes of our Creator. And we need to remember as well that God has been very mindful of us all. As David wrote in Psalm 8, verse 4, What is man that the Lord is mindful of him? Truly, why, who am I? Why has God been mindful of me? And the reason being is, I am His creation as a human being. And I have a certain sense of dignity and worth in the eyes of God. I have so much worth in His sight that He was willing to sacrifice His only begotten Son so that I would not have to spend an eternity in hell separate and apart from Him. That's how much He cares for you and for me. We need to have that same care for our fellow man. Don't be envious of others. Be thankful for what we do have, not envying for what we don't have. 
Thus, we need to cultivate and grow in genuine love toward one another. Remember, Paul said there in 1 Corinthians 13 that without love I am nothing. And truly we are. And then this love we are to possess envieth not. And that's the challenge of possessing a 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love is to keep envy out. If we love one another, we will not envy. Paul warns us and Paul admonishes us in Galatians 5. In verse 26, let us, let us not be desirous of vain glory. Don't be seeking vain, glory, vain empty glory. Provoking one another. Envying one another. And, the, and again, this, the pride of life is another reason why so many people are envious. It's pride which leads to envy. But rather, let us not be desirous of this vain glory. Why? Because love worketh no ill toward his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Romans chapter 13, verse number 12. But we also need to fill our hearts. We need to fill our minds. We need to fill our lives with those things which are good, which are lovely, which are of good report. As Paul would write, and as Paul did write, in Philippians chapter 4, in verse number 8, we fill our mind up with those things there, and we're going to keep all those negative thoughts out. And we need, because we need to remember, as we alluded to this passage at the outset, sin begins in the heart. That's where it begins, and it works its way outward. Proverbs 23, 7, As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So we need to fill our hearts with these good things. And the challenge, and again, this is the challenge. Because we have to work on this every single day. Every single day. The challenge we have is to bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And that's not always easy, is it? We all struggle with it from time to time. But that's why you and I have to continue to work at it, to continue to improve. And that is why spiritual growth is so vitally important. That is why we must study God's Word daily so that we may grow thereby. That is why we must add to our faith those virtues that Peter talked about in 2 Peter chapter 1, that we may be fruitful and abound, that we will not be ignorant, and that we will not forget that we have been purged from our old sins. So that way we will not become spiritually blind. It is a challenge to live the faithful Christian life. No doubt about it. But the rewards thereof are worth the challenge, is it not? Heaven will surely be worth it all. Far beyond sorrow that here be fall. It'll be worth all the struggle we have in this life. God promised it to those who are faithful. That's what motivates us to do these things. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give unto thee the crown of life. There is an old story about an eagle that was envious of a fellow eagle. And the reason it was envious of this other eagle was because that eagle could fly better than this eagle could. And one day this, this one first eagle saw a sportsman with his bow and arrow and said to the man, I wish you'd bring that eagle down up there. Now the man said he would if he had some feathers for his arrow. You know what the jealous eagle did? He heard the response of the man, and the jealous eagle then pulled one out of his wing. He gave the man an arrow. The arrow was shot, but it didn't reach the rival bird because he was flying too high. The first eagle then put, pulled out feather after feather until he had lost so many feathers that he himself could not fly. Well, the man took advantage of this. And he turned around and killed the helpless bird. What's the point? The point is, if we are envious of others, the one you're going to hurt by your actions is yourself. 
Who did that eagle hurt in his attempt to get even with the other eagle? Well, he hurt himself. Well, why did he hurt himself? Because he pulled his feathers out and gave to the man, and as a result, when it came time for him to need to escape, he couldn't escape. His envy resulted in his death. It's not going to hurt anyone else but self. The cure for envy is to humble ourselves of pride and repent and turn to God. Tonight, as a Christian, if envy has caused you to stumble, please confess that sin and pray to God for forgiveness, and He will forgive. Don't let selfish pride destroy you. Do the wise thing. Change your attitude and mind, which results in a change of direction in your life. And do it right now as together we stand, as we sing.